Hello, True Crimeers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by Canadian Province. Today's video, we are going to New Brunswick uh, in Canada. And I'm actually going to be talking about not one, but two cases in this video. And that's because neither one of these cases has a lot of information about them. And there really is no current uh, update on either one of them either. But let us get into them. So, viewer discretion is advised. So, our first case takes us to Dieppe, uh, which is in New Brunswick, and the date is May 24th, 1970. 16-year-old Claire Gagnon was, I guess, out and about um, with some friends. It was a Sunday, um, and the family was expecting her home sometime before 5 p.m. because that's when dinner was going to be happening. The family lived on Gould Street, and by 5-ish, Claire still wasn't home. Um, they waited a few minutes longer. She still didn't come home. They almost immediately uh, started panicking because this was very much unlike Claire. Um, she would never not be home uh, when she was expected home. She's a very good kid. Um, so the parents essentially would report her missing pretty quickly. And, you know, once the, the police got involved that evening, they searched around the area. They don't know the exact last location she was actually seen in. They don't really have any witnesses um, to say, like, who saw her last, you know, if she was by herself. I believe they talked to her friends and she had gone on her own, started to go back home, I'm there assuming, and she just never got there. About a day later, uh, they would find Claire. It did appear that she was probably on her way home because about 300 yards away from her house, her body was found. Claire was just dumped in a field. Uh, she had electrical wiring wrapped around her neck and she had like a, a towel that was bunched up and kind of shoved in her mouth. Obviously for the killer, they're probably, they probably did that to you know, stop her from screaming. Police, you know, again, when they asked her friends, the last time they saw her was about two or three o'clock that afternoon. But like I said earlier, after that, in between, uh, no one came forward to say they saw her anywhere. And there really wasn't much physical evidence left uh, on her body that they were able to use to, like, say, catch someone. Um, this is also 1970. Uh, so this is well before any modern enhancements um, in, uh, you know, crime scene detection. Uh, so they probably didn't even collect everything they would have thought about collecting, like if it was an investigation nowadays. It would be in 1993 or so when a man would come forward to police and he confessed to being the one to kill Claire. Um, and he was actually then arrested and charges were filed against him. They were getting ready to go, you know, to do the court proceedings. And then they realized, because the investigation was still ongoing into him um, while all this was all going on, they realized there's no way he could have done it uh, because this man was checked into a psychiatric hospital um, and it was confirmed without a shadow of a doubt that he was there during the time um, that Claire was murdered. And so they let him go uh, because he couldn't have done it. But that's it. That's where the case literally has left off. Since 1993, there's been pretty much no updates. There's no leads. There's no suspects. I don't know if they looked into her friends. I'm not sure. Uh, I assume they did, and I assumed they probably confirmed their whereabouts and their alibis and whatnot, but I don't know for 100% sure. But all I know is that her case right now is still very much unsolved. It's been over 50 years now. The odds of the case like this being solved probably pretty low at this point. But a lot of new technology, we're seeing a lot of older cases actually being solved because of 
you know, genealogical DNA testing and all that, but I don't know if they really have DNA in this case. So, unfortunately, this may just go on forever as being unsolved. Our second case takes place in Oromakto, which is in New Brunswick, if I said that correctly. Unfortunately, I do not have any photos of the victim. I really don't have any photos whatsoever for this case, uh, not of, like, the house where it happened or anything. Um, but the date was November 28th, 1990. 70-year-old Henri Ligère, uh, he lived in a house with his 88-year-old sister and, I guess, his 78-year-old sister-in-law. Around 9.30 p.m., um, one of the witnesses would say there was a knock at the door. So his 88-year-old sister, Sophie, she answered the door because Henri was already um, in bed. It's when then two men who were wearing masks barged into the home. They were each holding a gun, which would later be determined to be a 22 caliber um, weapon. And they also had like a, a wooden stick of some kind, um, obviously, to use as a weapon. These two men started to yell at everyone in the house. Henri had woken up. He had gone down to see what was going on. So now they're all being held at gunpoint. These two men are demanding all the money, whatever expensive goods, you know, jewelry and whatnot they may have to hand them over immediately. Sophie uh, says she tried to run, and then one of the men grabbed her and threw her, um, and she landed really hard on the ground and suffered some pretty bad injuries. The uh, intruders then took uh, some duct tape, and they basically tied both of the women up. Henri was trying to fight the two men, uh, trying to get them you know, to, to stop, but what they did uh, was these two men grabbed him, and they brought him upstairs back to his room, and they started to beat him with that uh, stick that they had. Henri was beaten so badly that he was knocked completely unconscious and he fell into a coma. Um, the two men got a couple of things, a little bit of money, maybe some jewelry, and then they fled while leaving the two women um, tied up. But they were eventually able to get themselves free. They called the police. They described the situation. Uh, they described the gun they saw, which is how police were de determined that they likely used a 22 caliber based on the description, but no gunshots were actually fired. The house was located on Oulette Road, um, and it, it was a very long, uh, just sort of desolate stretch of road at the time. Uh, it only had a handful or so of houses. Uh, there really wasn't anywhere um, well lit. There wasn't many witnesses or any witnesses any at all to say they saw a certain vehicle or a certain person. Um, they had their masks on the entire time. Um, and so all they could really do was describe the situation um, and like what their, maybe their voices sounded like and the weapons they had. That's it. Henri was rushed to the hospital um, where he basically was already in a coma. Um, and he never, ever came out of it. Uh, he survived, um, technically, for three years before he finally succumbed to the injuries and he died. And there was just, again, kind of like the first case, there really wasn't much evidence. There just wasn't really anything for police to use to try to find these two um, assailants. And... Unfortunately, it's it's been a dead end ever since 1990. They've got nothing. So um, police are just basically on the lookout for two men who may have been robbing other homes at the time. Um, but it's, it could be anyone. <laughs> I believe they did interview like other family members to see if there was any issues in the family. Anything, but none of them worked because they were all elderly people. Um, all very much retired, um, and they didn't really leave their house as much to get involved with anything or anyone. So it's it just was a random occasion, and those are almost impossible to solve. But if you by chance have any information about this case, you can contact the RCMP, uh, their uh, major crime uh, division. Their number is 506-452. 
And for the first case, I forgot to mention, if you have any information about Claire Gagnon's case, you can call uh, the other RCMP office in her area at 506-857-2403. You never know. The smallest piece of information can break this entire thing wide open. Um, so if you have anything, anything at all, that you can help with for either of these cases, please do. But that is it for today's video. Uh, I will be back with you guys tomorrow, which is going to be Wednesday, uh, with a full-length true crime story. But in the meantime, ta-ta for now. True crime, Rooney ding dong, ding dong, ding dongs. Oh, now I want a ding dong. The food, not the the thing. The f <laughs>